Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness and your mercy. We thank you for the way you have been with us from morning. And we ask now that as we spend a short time, that you will be with us. And that your angels will be with us. And your, and your Holy Spirit will be on our minds. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me just take this opportunity to thank those of you who have been praying for me. Really grateful. Please don't stop praying for me at all. Amen. for Bible study has been very shortened, I feel obliged that I must share with you from Professor Dale Martin, I have him here as male, but his right name is really Dale, from Yale University. Now, those of us who were present earlier today would have heard what has happened in our institution. But despite the fact that this man teaches at Yale, I find him an honest man. Now, we've been discussing methods of Bible study. So most of us know about exegesis, but we don't know the different divisions of exegesis. So I'm going to introduce one to you called historical criticism. Ever heard that? Let me see the hands of those who have ever heard it. All right. All right, so can we see it? No, too big, too big. No, they can see it. No. They can see it. No, you have to have the higher cost of No. no. Yeah. Can you see it? Yeah. All right, great. Now, he starts up by saying, no, in order to use Jewish scripture to teach the superstition of Judaism by Christianity, you know that he's going to have interpreted it in what we would consider very creative ways. Now, this is how he describes it. And he says, we can use that to contrast the way I've been teaching you to interpret these texts in the court, which is through historical critical exegesis from the way that Christians, he's contrasting now, from the way that Christians have interpreted this text from all the way through history. This is not just Christian. Jewish interpretation of scripture is just as creative as Christian interpretation of scripture before the modern period. So the question is, what then is historical criticism? He says, the meaning of a text according to historical criticism is what the ancient human author intended it to mean. That's what they teach in university. The expansion of this, that is the author's intention, comes to be in a lot of studies, even within historical criticism, that another way to think about the meaning of the text is that the meaning of the text is what the original readers probably would have thought it meant. I don't know how we enter into the minds of the original readers. He says, because of course we can't get the intentions of the author that's lost to us completely, we have no idea what's going on inside the minds of these ancient authors. But by practicing historiographical research, we can guess at what probably an ancient reader would have taken the text to mean, and so that's been added on as another meaning that historical criticism looks for. I thought we had the sure word of prophecy. He says a third point about historical criticism I want to make here is that it assumes a sort of modern historical consciousness. It what? Assumes. And when you assume, you and I know what happened, right? I have to say that? Okay, good. What that means with historical criticism in the 20th century, you have theological students being taught a little bit about ancient Near Eastern society and culture. In fact, you have entire departments of ancient Near Eastern studies arise in modern universities. And they don't arise just because people are automatically interested in Near Eastern cultures. They arise as support for biblical studies. Let's go on. He says, this reflects the idea that if you want to get back into these texts in their ancient period, you have to develop knowledge of that period. Why? Because we have developed a historical 
consciousness. This also means that we teach people you need to read these texts, if possible, in the original languages. And remember, everybody remember that last week? Yes, you have to read the other languages if you are going to be an exegete. So why is it important for us? Why do you accept that it's important? Why does it seem natural to you that I write the Greek text up here and explain what its Greek meaning means in the ancient world? Because you have this historical consciousness too. You have the what? Assumption that this ancient meaning of your original language is important for the interpretation of the text. By the way, this lecture is online, you see? Fourth, historical criticism teaches you we don't interpret the Bible canonically as a book together. That means a couple of different things. We don't take the whole canon of the Bible and interpret it all by reference to other parts of the canon. Did you hear that? Mm -hmm. You don't use one part to interpret the other, as Miller says. Proof text dead. No, proof text dead. Well, why not? He says Christians have been doing that for 2,000 years. Who? Christians. Ah. Historical criticism, though, takes the canon apart. Says each individual document must be studied in its own right and for its own content. So one thing that means is that we don't study the Bible as what? One book. We study the Bible as a series, as a library of books. Each one individually studied. The other aspect of this is that we are in the modern, we in the modern period don't limit ourselves to the study of the canon. Okay? Yes, Ella, before we go on. Listen good now, you know. Him say, what? And you need to hear him on tape saying this. The little white guy with a bald head. He says, why did I, a crazy mix of professor that I am, you know what I'm saying? Him say, mix up. Think that it was worthwhile for you to read non-canonical second century document in a class called Introduction to New Testament History and Literature. He said, I'll tell you why. I've been brainwashed by the modern historical critical method to believe that putting pastoral epistles and those other canonical texts into a historical context that include non-canonical materials is a good way to teach you how to think about this New Testament thing. That's part of the historical critical method. So I remember when our goodly professor went on religious hard talk and went on about historical criticism. Some of my brethren were up in arms. Where, where's Kirk? Is Kirk here? Kirk is not here. Kirk told us that he went to Ella's meeting at the Ella's meeting. They were wrongly told that nothing was wrong with what was said. And when Dr. Andre Hill went on and did his thing, anybody remember that? He said nothing was wrong with it. I knew that. Yeah, there was nothing to quarrel with him about. He said, fifth, in spite of the fact that we don't study the Bible canonically in modern historical criticism, we actually look for source analysis. For example, we take the idea that these ancient authors actually did use sources. He said, if you took a course in Hebrew Bible, an introduction to Hebrew Bible, or even a seminar introduction to Old Testament, you're going to get this theory crammed down your throat that because this is one of the most dominant theories of modern historical criticism of the Hebrew Bible, it's source analysis. That's part of what we're doing. I thought also... I thought also that 2 Peter, the letter to Peter, used Jude as one of his sources. Again, that kind of source analysis is part of the method. The next one, I think, I'm up to six, in spite of the fact that talking about authorship of all these documents, part of the modern historical criticism questions on the authenticity of the authorship all the time, questions the authenticity of the authorship all the time. And he says these are basic aspects of modern historical criticism. You can tell you're in the modern period because they feel the need to explain the theory to you. Anyway, even if they don't buy it. That missed you, didn't you? That missed you. You want me to read it again? Yes. He said they, they can tell you you're in the modern period because they feel the need to explain the theory to you anyway. Even if they don't buy it. Much like how a lot of our theologians don't believe in the spirit of prophecy. But they will read it. They'll teach it to you because it's part of the modern way of approaching the Bible. 
Next he says is the avoidance of anachronism. This is a big bad thing in modern historical criticism. Don't be anachronistic. Don't think back into the ancient text something that actually arose later. For example, most historical critics of the Bible say it is certainly wrong to read the doctrine of Trinity into Genesis. Modern historical criticism rejects that and says that's wildly anachronistic. So when we identify that the Holy Spirit was present at creation, they are saying you can't do that. They say you can't do that. The doctrine of the Trinity was developed centuries after the writing of Genesis. You can't read it back there. It's anachronism. Now, this is why La Chang now. The last big boogeyman of historical criticism is eisegesis. Did you remember that last week? Let us say you read into the text. Same thing, proof text. If you go to, listen now, if you go to any kind of seminary, they'll warn you against eisegesis. Why? Because this is reading into the text something that's not in the text and they are playing off the word. Of course, I've used this before, exegesis. Exegesis simply means, as you have already learned in this course, interpreting a text. What is eisegesis? It's just some modern pious person picking up the Bible and seeing anything they want to see in it. It's reading into because this means out of and this Greek word means into. So eisegesis, you are taught to avoid it. Where? Where the teacher to avoid it? Seminary. But nobody teaches that at church. Amen? You don't get it, do you? No? We here are into eisegesis. We read into the Bible. That's what they say. We use one part to interpret another part. Them say no. Them say you take one book and it's one book only. At a time like the left. What do you say, sir? do exegesis, sir. All right. <laughs> okay. No, I get it. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I apologize. All right. So he says, so I see Jesus, you are taught to avoid it. This is in seminary. Then finally, one of the last major presuppositions that relates to this historical consciousness I talked about, the idea that there's a gap between the world of the Bible and our world. This is my father's world. No, he says, I'm not going to read this part, but um, he says, they will talk about, and they might use the term gap, but that's what I call it. And when they're doing it, saying there's a gap between their culture and their world and ours, the consciousness of that gap is a major aspect of modern historical criticism. And before he was giving a, a, a little th thesis about what happens with the wearing of the hat and so on. We, that came up recently when we were looking last year when the topic was hot about female ordination. Anybody remember that? And those of us who said the Bible said we were, we're part of the gap. That's anachronistic, man. How dare you say that women shouldn't be ordained? I only asked one question during the whole argument. Where's, where's her wife? Because if a man wants to be a bishop, he must be the husband of? So where's our wife if she's an elder? That's all I'm asking. I beg your pardon, sir? Okay. All right, wait. Look, 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 look. The Ella did enough on that this morning. Please. <laughs> now, he says this historical criticism didn't just spring out of the Bible itself. Where did it come from? Why do we have it and where did it come from? Well, as you know, before the Reformation, anybody heard anything about the Reformation this morning? Yeah. Very important, the Reformation. We are standing on the foundations of the Reformation. Yeah. Basically, the Bible, scripture was supposed to mean what the Catholic Church said it meant. And what the Pope said it, what the worship said it meant. The authority and structure of the church was taken to be the way that you control wild interpretations. People in the ancient knew you can interpret a text any way you want to. So what keeps heretics from interpreting the text in false ways? The institution of the church. So we all see later Ignatius, when we, when we are reading his letters, he says you can't just interpret scripture any way. Any, I guess this is any way you want to. You must be in agreement with your? Okay. The rule of the bishop and the rule of the church was the way to keep control over the interpretation of the text. Of course, in the pre-Reformation time, you did have the rise of humanism and, and renaissance, 
we started questioning that a bit and they started going back and looking at the original Hebrew, the original Greek, insisting that you should read these texts in the original languages and not just in Latin. That was before the Reformation. You already have this move toward history and reading the text in historical context in the humanist movement and Renaissance. No, the question is, why do all this stuff anyway? Why have I first been teaching you the historical critical method? Well, I can answer that. That's why I say he's a, mother, he's, a, he's a honest man. It is because that's the dominant way that the Bible is taught in modern American universities. And I don't believe Jamaica is any different. All right. <laughs> no, no, He says, but I also believe that we should study, this is a professor talking now. He says, but I also believe we should study other ways of what? Studying the Bible also, at least to be introduced to them. It shows you there are other quite what? Legitimate ways to interpret the text. What is the professor saying? He's saying ICGC is legitimate. Yes, yes Ella. Yes. Why is all that important? He says, I think it's important to realize that because, this is why it's important, because the vast majority of Christians throughout human history have not read the Bible the way you are learned to, learning to read it in this class. Did you get that? The professor is saying that historical critical method of reading the Bible is not how the majority of Christians read their Bible. That's what the professor is saying. He's teaching it to them, you know. But he's an honest man. He said, look, this is not the only way. I'm only a teacher because this is what American University do. He's saying that's not the way most of us read our Bibles. Amen? Wow, I didn't get an amen. Did I lose you? No. Hold on, he says, in spite of the fact that I'm teaching you this method, I still want to drum it into your heads at least this week. That this is just one way of doing it and you need to be aware of the other ways of doing it. Because in some ways they are culturally more important as far as the impact of Bible and Western civilization. The man is saying, look, despite what I'm teaching you in university, the, me who is sitting in the people who don't have the training, the Bible means more to me in the way I read it than what he's teaching them. Amen? Yeah. That's what he's saying. Yes, Allah. Is part of our environment too. But I would say that if as an important way to approach the Bible, it is, not, it is not a sufficient way to approach the Bible. What the man is saying is that the way they are training them is not sufficient. It's, um, it's, certain, it's it certainly historical criticism is not sufficient for the Christian theological reading of the Bible because the historical meaning of the context, I think, as people are beginning to realize in churches cannot provide you with enough to use this text theologically and ethically. What that means, brethren, is that whatever they are teaching them, when they come to present to you, they can't help you to put it into practical life. That's what the professor is saying. He says you have to do something else with the text besides just history. If you still want to use it as scripture, that's why today I'm mixing things up and trying to get you to see these things differently. Essentially, the professor is saying that whatever they're teaching them in school is just one way. But the majority of us outside of the school don't read the Bible that way. In other words, they're in the minority. Yes. They are in the minority in the way they study their Bibles. Alright, so for those of you who were not here last week, what we did was to go through how our church transitioned from the proof text method around about the 1930s to today. But before the 1930s, the Millerites, our pioneers studied the Bible one way. 
Line upon line, the burial method. Line upon line, here a little, there a little. So when you hear the pastor say, come with me to here. And come with me to here. When you go to church, that's what they tell you. Come with me here and come with me there. No, they tell you a story. And then they jump around for about 15 minutes. Go to one text. Am I lying? Am I true? And they jump around for about half hour. And then your, your family member comes to them and says, but well, the sermon was good. So what did he say? Um, do you know what I'm talking about? Do you know, they can't tell you what was said. I, I remember my family coming home and telling me about the music from Mission Impossible. That's how, this, how the sermon started. Can you imagine that? Alright, so. Quickly, let's go to the spirit of prophecy. And then we'll see if we... Okay, let's go there last. Um, could you turn off for me, brother? Um, let's just turn off for a shot. Well, let's, let's go to our Bible. How much time do I have, Sister Jackie? I have another 10 minutes. So I used up my half hour. <laughs> All right, so last week we read from John 6. Amen? Anybody remember? Anybody remember last week? Anybody remember what chapter of Great Controversy I suggested you go home and read? The scriptures are safeguard. All right, so last week we had gotten to look at how does one eat the bread of life. Anybody remember that? And we had gone to the book of Ezekiel. And Ezekiel was told that he must eat the word. Now, the elder at the time, yes sir. Yes, sir. Last week that we should have gone to Revelation 10, and we went to verse 9 and 10, where John was told to eat the book. It would be bitter, it would be sweet to his mouth and bitter to his belly. And at that time, we wanted to look at what belly and bowels mean. Amen? So go, come with me to Jeremiah 4.19. Jeremiah 4, 19, and let's see what bowels are. Because if it's, if it's sweet in the mouth, but bitter to the belly, we need to know what does the Bible mean by bowels or belly. Are you at Jeremiah 4, 19? Yeah. My bowels, my bowels, I am. And my heart maketh a noise in me. So it's going to have an effect on the heart. Lamentations 1, verse 20. Lamentations 1 verse 20. If you have found it, say amen. amen. Behold, O Lord, for I am in distress. My bowels are troubled and my heart. So the word of God is supposed to have an effect where? On your heart. No. There's a passage of scripture which talks about the belly. I found it interesting in Proverbs 20 verse 27. Don't know if you've ever read it yet. It says, The spirit of man is a candle of the Lord, searching all the inward parts of the belly. So we know that the belly represents the heart. Does anybody else search the heart? The spirit searches the heart. That's found in Romans 8 verse 27. Now, for the value of time, I'm going to jump. Now, is the heart a place of joy and delight? And it can also be a place of sorrow? Yes. Now, look at what the word of God does in Jeremiah 15, 16. We repeated it last week, but for, for emphasis, let's read it. Jeremiah 15, 16. Jesus says we are to eat his word. So let's go. Are we there, Jeremiah 15, 16? Are we there? Yes. Amen. Thy words were found, and I did eat them, and thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of my heart, for I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. So, the point to be made is that the word of God is supposed to bring what to our hearts? And delight. Are you having that experience? You don't have to answer me. If you're not having it, that's the one to strive for. Yes, Brother Hanson. Yes. I heard you. 
I heard you. I heard you. And and uh, we won't have time. Believe me. We, we we started last week. Just do it once. All right. All right. All right. All right, sir. All right. All right. All right. All right. I I concede. I concede. Yes. Yeah. But most of us not going to use them fancy English word then, sir. We just say, the Bible say, the belly represents the heart. That's all we are going to say. We're not getting to the... Because that's how most of us read it. All right. So, what we did last week for those who weren't here, we looked for the word eat. Anybody remember that? E-A-T. Brother Marvin, are you putting me up, please? Eat. So there's eating and eat it and so on. Jesus said you must eat his flesh. So we wanted to get the concept of eat, Brother Hansen. Are we there, Brother Marvin? Are we there? Okay, so we went to the concordance. Now, we have 655 matches and 583 verses found. Now, usually when I'm doing this, I say to brethren, look, when you're studying the Bible, you can't be in any hurry. That's why you need to pray and make the time. What did the scripture reading say? What did the spirit of prophecy say last week? An hour every day. Nobody remember that? Okay. So, there's a lot of words here for eat. But, in my search, and by the way, when, when you're using the computer, it's easier than when you're using the actual book because you have to turn the leaves and turn the leaves and turn the leaves. Right? Teach your patience. Yes, brother T. So, we searched and we went down to Ezekiel. Anybody remember that? And in Ezekiel, we start at Ezekiel 2. Right? And he says that he's to open the mouth and eat that I give thee. Now, when you go to the Bible and read the chapter, what the Bible is actually saying is that the words that he's giving them, giving to him, he's to eat it. Yes. Now, verse, verse 3, verse 2 here, he says, so I opened my mouth and he caused me to eat the roll. Now, when you're studying, you now need to go and find out what a role is. Is that okay? So, can we go and look for the role? Good. All right. So, what I'm going to do, I'm going to change the word up here and I'm going to put role. So, I'm looking for role. So, we know that in Isaiah 8.1, a role is something that you're writing. Can you see that? Take their great role and write in it with a man's pen. Are we able to see it? Good. Now when we go to the next verse, Jeremiah 36 2, it says what? Well, Take thee the role of a book. And that is why in Revelation 10, what was John told? Take what? The little book. Now in their days they never necessarily had book, they wrote on scrolls. Alright? Now Jeremiah 36 4 also talks about the role of a book. So Ezekiel was told to eat what? The book. The role. All right, so let's go back to eat now because we're not done with it. Is that okay? Yes. Brother Hansen, are we answering you? Yes, sir. Okay, good. By the way, is everybody with, is everybody with me? Yes. If, if you're not with me, I, I'll have to stop and do it again. Okay. Well, hold on, Brother Hansen. Everybody in the room with me? Yes. It's really an abridged version because usually when I'm doing this lesson, it's about four lessons in one. Four lessons, one after the other, one hour each. So this is really a bridge. So we are back at eat and we were in Ezekiel. Everybody with me? Yes. Alright. Remember, then we... You remember we talked about Jeremiah? Anybody remember Jeremiah? Anybody remembered? So while we are looking for eat, what we did... See Jeremiah 15, 16 here. Anybody remember that? Yes. Thy words were found and I did eat them. Yes? And they were the joy and rejoicing of my heart. So for here, could I substitute it was a joy and rejoicing of my bowel or belly? Ah, you're with me. Amen. Alright. So that was how we would talk about eating Brother Hansen. Yes. 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 And get the scripture to answer them. So for those of you who were here last week, when we went through the rules of Bible study, 
we learn that the Bible answers itself. The rule says it is its own expositor. Yes? Every word must have its bearing on the next word. So, Ellen White says in a place that, look, when something appeared obscure to Miller, he went somewhere else in the Bible to find it. What they are saying in their rules of exegesis, you don't do that. That's a gap. Don't do that. All right. So, so because of time, let me just share with you some of what I have in my study. How shall we live? How does Jesus say we are to live, brethren? What do you see there? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Who was Jesus quoting, by the way? He was quoting Moses. Do you see it there? And what is this bread, brethren, that you see it? Daniel, Deuteronomy 8 says, All the commandments which I command you this day shall you observe to do that he may. That's how we're going to live. And verse 2 says, Thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these 40 years. To know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no. Now what does verse 3 say? And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna. Which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know. That he might make thee know that man doth not. But by every word that. So let me ask you. Verse 6 says, Therefore thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God. To what? And to fear him. So tell me something. If you ain't eating food, sister... If you're not eating food, what is happening to you? You're starving. And, and, and eventually you're going to die. So what is the word saying here? If you don't study the word, you... You're a walking dead? Okay. Do, last week when we read John 6, he says that you're getting eternal life from eating it. Anybody remember that? John 6? Which one? <laughs> okay. 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 Alright. Got you. Got you. Alright. I want I want to move on. I don't know how much time I have, but let's just do this one and then I'll be quiet. Psalm 17 verse 4. I have five more minutes. Okay. So, uh, you notice my subtopic, what I put there? What do you see as my subtopic? What, what do you see, brother, brother Akil? What does the text say? And concerning the word, you're talking about the word of the Lord. You agree? Yes? Now, what is a destroyer, may I ask? Yes, Rome is a beast and the dragon is Satan. Okay. And who am I working for? Ah. Let's go through this. So, what's a destroyer? Now, anybody remember the experience of the beginning of the Exodus? Was there a destroyer that killed all of the firstborn? Yes. Oh yeah. Why? Why do you think that happened? They didn't obey the word of the Lord. But the people who did, what was the word of the Lord to the people who obeyed? No man. There was a specific instruction. That the lamb that they had killed there to use the blood to what? He hid it on the doorpost. That was the word, you know. That was the command of God at the time, you know. And any Israelite who didn't do it, you know what would happen? There would be? Their firstborn would have been destroyed. Yes. Okay. Now, anybody remember Revelation 19? There's a word in there called 9-11. It says Apollyon. There's a king over them. And in the Hebrew tongue it's called Apollyon. So I looked up the meaning of the word. You see what the meaning of the word is there? So if we were to substitute that, because it also means Satan, 
Concerning the works of men by the word of their lips, I have kept me from the parts of the destroyer who is Satan. Because I'm doing ICG, Jesus, I can put that in there. Yes. Yes. Anybody have a problem with that? No. 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 Because, 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 because of the meaning of the word. And we are, we are, we are further around in, this, in, in another text. People have bring out another word to me, Satan. That's what I'm giving back All right. Is there a text in the Bible which says the devil is like a roaring lion? So a devourer is a destroyer? I'm, I'm going to end this study here. I'm not, I'm not holding up a time. Listen, brethren. This is the message. This is the message. If you're not feeding on the word, brother Leroy, if you're not getting the heavenly manna every day, All right, I love that, brother Chan. I love that. But please, if you're not getting it twice, get it once. At least. At least. Death is pronounced on you. Death is pronounced on you. I'm sorry to be the one to have to tell you. But if you ain't eating it every day, you're in big trouble. No. Yes, Sir, <laughs> sir, sir, take that with me now, sir. <laughs> All right, let me just do some quick spirit of prophecy. Brother Marvin, could you give me a little space to do a quick spirit of prophecy reading and then I'll be done. Now, this is, I can't remember which book this is, but it says, people are to be educated to search the scriptures. Search the scriptures for in them he think he have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. The present is a time of great peril to the people of God. God is leading out a people, not an individual here and there. Take heed therefore how you hear is an admonition of Christ. We are to hear for the sake of learning the truth that we may walk in it and again take heed what you hear, examine closely, prove all things, believe not every spirit. This is the counsel of God that we shall heed. Uh, uh, in, okay. Right, this is the quote. People should be educated to search the scriptures for themselves, to dare to think for themselves, taking the Bible as their guidebook, their standard of faith. Although heresy might leave its head boldly and in solitude by perverted ideas and false interpretations and misapplication of scripture, there should be no suppression of religious freedom by reformers. All right, let, let me go down because I want to finish, Sister Jackie. Now, this is taken from, oh, did I miss the, the reference? Oh, no. Right. Special Testimonies, 01A12, number one, it says, There is a sad neglect of reading the Bible and searching it with humble hearts for yourselves. Take no man's explanation of scripture. Nothing that I see up here this afternoon. You must take it. That it is fight a complaint. Yeah, that was Latin, meaning that it is a final declaration. Am I right, Sister Knight? Yeah. No. You have a duty. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. To go search that. Yeah. Whatever his position, but go to the Bible and search the truth for who? Yeah. Yourselves. One more. Let's see if we go on another one. Many have become lazy. No, no, listen to the term she used in a brethren. I know me now. Many have become lazy and criminally neglectful in regard to the searching of the scriptures and they are destitute of the spirit of God as a knowledge of the word of God. Criminally. A crime. When you commit a crime, you break the law. So clearly there is a law which says study your Bible. Oh, you didn't know that? Yeah, man. Wait a minute. Se second Timothy 2.15 Study So if you break that rule, <laughs> yeah. She so said, but there is but little benefit derived from a hasty reading of the scriptures. You hear that? Don't be hasty about reading it. We cannot obtain wisdom without earnest attention and prayerful study. Some portions of the scripture are indeed too plain to be misunderstood. But there are others whose meaning does not lie on the surface to be seen at a glance. Scripture must be what? There must be what? 
And study will be richly repaired. That is proof text studying. Alright. Sister Jackie, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish up now. Um, by the way, she says that this one, she said there are some people who say they don't care. Alright? Not going to read it. Well, how can the Lord bless those who manifest a spirit of I don't care? A spirit which leads them to walk contrary to the life which the Lord has given them. But I do ask you to I, I do not ask you to take my word. She said, lay Sister White aside. Some conference men were quarreling. And apparently wanted to use our words. She said, you don't do that. Do not quote my words again as long as you live until you can obey the Bible. <laughs> when you make the Bible your food, your meat, your drink, when you make its principles, the elements of your character, you will know better how to receive counsel from God. I exalt the precious word of God before you today. She said, do not repeat what I have said, saying Sister White said this, and Sister White said that. Find out what the Lord God of Israel says, and then do what he commands. Amen. Amen. I'm not saying you're not to quote spirit of prophecy, no, but she said before, you quote her, go and find out what uh, the Bible says. All right, let me go to the very last quote, Sister Jackie, and then I will sit. But <laughs> I must say this. Please go and read The Great Controversy, page 627. You will learn that after the fourth plague, there's a famine for the word of God, and people are going to be running up and down to find the word of God. That's in Amos 8, I believe. But there will be no food for you at that time. Eat it now. Get fat now, because when the famine comes, no food. Alright, so let me go to the last quote. And brothers and sisters, this is taken from Lift Him Up, chapter 1, clothing Christ, righteousness. I believe this morning, the pastor talked about the signs of education. We're going to look a little bit now at the signs of salvation. And let me tell you something. I said it last week, so I'm going to repeat it before I read it. If you're not feeding in this little school down here on earth, the same one that Adam started out in, Christ used to come and talk with him. He has given us opportunity to feed on him. Listen what happens if you're not doing it. The waters of life still flow in abundant streams of salvation. The mysteries of redemption, the blending of the divine and the human in Christ. His incarnation, sacrifice, mediation will be sufficient to supply minds, hearts, tongues, and pens with themes of thought and expression for all time. Amen. And time will not be sufficient to exhaust the wonders of salvation. Listen this now. But when? Throughout everlasting ages, Christ will be the signs and the song of of the redeemed soul. You think you start study yet? You haven't started yet. We just begin. We're just tasting now. But when we get there, you think it's only judgment is going to happen after judgment, man, when we start to live in, 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 in eternity. That time we're going to eat food. So get your palates now. Start to taste now. Yeah, I, I understand from the sermon this man what the education system has done. And, 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 and I know what that is. You remember I told you last week when we identified the liberal Seventh-day Adventists that I was one of them? Had no stomach for the spirit of prophecy? That's what the education system does to you. Because you're going to say she's a third grade woman so you're not going to read what she has to say. Well, guess what? She's a servant of the Lord. So my brothers and sisters, my encouragement to you as I take my seat. Get acquainted with the word of God. Let it become your joy and delight because your salvation depends on it. Let us pray. Father, we thank you. Father, we thank you for the few moments we have spent. And we now ask that your Holy Spirit will give us that strong desire to eat the heavenly manna, to eat your flesh and drink your blood. So that, Lord, we may become fortified. So that the destroyer will not be able to come near us. As you said, that the devil cometh, but he had nothing in you. And this is what you want to be now magnified in us. Thank you for hearing and answering us this evening. And be with us for the rest of the afternoon as we enter into the communion service. 
We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.